Now, um, I'm going to introduce a man with the wonderful name of Felipe Bustos Sierra. Now, he's a Belgian um, documentary filmmaker, and he's won awards all over Europe for his documentaries, and he's currently working on his first full-length documentary called Ne Passaran. And this is the story of Scottish Rolls-Royce workers who in the 1970s refused to build or maintain engines for the Pinochet's horrific regime in Argentina, and then again in the 1980s for the South African apartheid regime. And he's got two, and then two of those wonderful gentlemen who were part of the Workers' Committee in those days, uh, John Keenan and Stuart Barry, are here with him tonight. And Stuart's quoted as saying, if you're a working class Scot, you get up in the morning, you have your porridge, and you say no to fascism. Please give them a very warm welcome. Hi, I'm obviously I'm neither John nor Stuart. I'm Felipe. I'm. Um, I've been in Scotland for 11 years. It's been my, my second home. I was born in Belgium um, shortly after the coup in Chile. My father was a, was a Chilean journalist who had to go into exile. And I, I sort of came of age and my understanding of what happened to Chile really through films and through documentaries. And the, uh, the most iconic image of the coup, something you may have seen, it's this grainy black and white footage of these planes flying low over Santiago and flying rockets to the palace, where uh, the president, the elected president, Allende, who was the first uh, democratically elected uh, left-wing president in South America, was refusing to surrender. And him and about 60 people who had some guns, some machine guns, uh, were basically uh, besieged by tanks and, and planes. And that was, that was an irreversible image. And I think when I was six, seven, eight, we kept playing these images. We used to go to Solidarity Campaign, uh, Solidarity Nights, a bit like tonight. And we'd, we'd see film clips, we'd hear music. The Chile Solidarity was, was accompanied by this wonderful music, and we hear people talk. And one night um, in Brussels, I remember, and this must have been in the 80s, so well after all these events had actually been finished. But we were still talking about them as if they were going on. And I remember pe people feeling quite wary. This would have been mid-80s, which meant that the, uh, the, um, the referendum, the first referendum uh, in Chile, which would lead the way to democracy, was only three years away. It was five years away until Pinochet stepped down. So there was a wariness. But for me, hearing that, there was a story somewhere that somebody had managed to defeat those planes, to, do, to kind of overturn that image. That absolutely blew my mind. And as I grew older, I, tro I, you know, I sort of put all that behind me. Um, there, was, there wasn't really, everything was so bleak about Chile. There was, democracy had come back, yes, but uh, Pinochet had stepped down on his own terms. And there was still so much unknown. All the archives were still unreleased. So many people had disappeared. So many people had been dead and were still um, completely unknown to their whereabouts. And it's only when I moved to Scotland that this word came back to me. Well, two words, really, East Kilbride. That was the, the little town where the factory, I know what an exotic place, isn't it? That was the, the town of the factory where the Rolls Royce factory where these men had uh, boycotted the um, the, these planes, because that's what we heard at the time. We didn't know they were engines. We thought that the, um, these planes, the Hawker Hunters, which were built in Britain, um, had come back to Scotland for maintenance, and these guys had blacked us. When I got this, I understood it wasn't the planes, it was the engine. This is really how a lot of Chilean history has been passed on and has been preserved. It's through word of mass, it's been completely transformed, it's been embellished, it's been aggravated in many ways. And Personally, the first step, as you'll see in a, in a moment, the first step was making the short film. But this, um, I found it to be a powerful experience. This idea of, by the time I think I felt I had the, I had the, um, the, the know-how, the strength, the intellect, anything to kind of do something about it. Of course, everything had ended. But the, one of the most powerful you can do about Chile is actually reclaim some of history and and overturn all the um, all the uh, the myth and the rumors and sort of very much the the history which has been written by the winners, 
which are the, uh, the, the fascist dictatorship in Chile. They're the winners of, of Chilean history. And overturning that in some ways and finding the truth and finding evidence that they didn't win all the way and that there were some people in Scotland and many places around the world who managed to find a way out and uh, find a way to spread their, the, um, this very simple idea that we're not alone. That was absolutely powerful. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll, we're going to show you two things tonight. The first one is quite special because nobody's ever seen this before. Uh, it's quite rough. This is basically what we've been um, putting together since making the short film, which we'll see afterwards. So this is about six minutes we've been uh, to show basically the impact and the context um, of this feature film that we're now working on. And after that, we'll show the short film, and then I'll introduce Johnny Stewart to the stage. Thank you. So this, this is something we're putting together for this new film, which will come out uh, next year. Um, but all this really started thanks to this short film um, that we managed to do about three years ago. We had very little access to information at the time, and I met three of the guys who basically initiated the action, which is Bob Fulton, Robert Somerville, and John Keenan. There were many more, but these are the guys I had access at the time. And, and this short film, which really is, is, is really just the story of the boycott itself and, and nothing or everything that came afterwards because it's the story itself that unlocked everything that followed when we uh, when the short film premiered for the first time in Chile and people were absolutely dumbfounded to find that you know with within this bubble of, of, of history of, of um, history about the coup they finally found a story that had some sort of positive ending or positive slant on it and it never heard of it it was being absolutely quashed by the censure the censorship at the time um, I'd like to add something, as you see in the, uh, what you've just seen, there were four characters and Stuart Barry was one of them. Unfortunately, I didn't get the story to Stuart early and on enough to have him included in the short film. Um, but uh, it, it was, it was um, it's, it's important to find out that those guys took their initiative and made it quite personal, but it was really the effort of an entire factory behind them that allowed for the, uh, the impact to be so, so wide and so deep. Um, at least this is the short film, and after that we'll come in with, the, uh, with Stuart and John and answer any question you might have. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, Bob Fulton is, is 93 and he's, he's well alive and he's in good spirits, but he gets tired you know, a lot quicker than usual, so he couldn't be here. And Robert Somerville has been in ill health at the moment. But um, it's actually the first time that we're, uh, some of us are here together to uh, screen the film. And uh, if you got something, I should tell you. Um, so one of the best things that came out of this um, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit we've got some wonderful surprises for the uh, for the feature film and there's the initial impact that we found from this action that they managed to ground half the air force in Chile for about four years and <laughs> it, it was the longest act of solidarity for Chile at the time and I think um, it might still be one of the longest like, like running act of solidarity. And it became a, a great tool for uh, all the solidarity campaigns at the time to make pressure on the, the British government um, to, um, to curtail their business with Chile. Um, which, and, and this, is, this is really the surface of what we found. And we started this about three years ago. Um, I, met, I met John and Robert and Bob and um, I think almost two, uh, this month, three years ago, and at the time we had no idea of how far this would go. Um, but I think I'll let them say a few things. No. 
Thanks very much, Philip. Uh, you put me in the spot. I wasn't expected to be asked to say a few words, but anyway, it's a pity that Robert Somerville and Bob Fulton can't be here, you know, to, to, to be here when the film's been shown again. Uh, the other thing I would like to say that uh, the three of us have been awarded, obviously, the Bernardo Higgins Award from the Chilean government, which was presented to the three of us in the city chambers on the 27th of March last year. And we were also presented with a gold medal from Unite last uh, July at Brighton at one of the conferences. So we were honoured to receive these awards, but remembering that we were shop stewards and members of the Works Committee at that time representing the workforce, and the award really is for the workers who took part in the solidarity action uh, that made such an impression. And we now know a lot more about actually what we did achieve uh, since Felipe has been involved in making the film. He's found out a lot more information, which he's obviously not going to uh, tell even me at the moment or yourselves tonight. And that'll be kept, obviously, for the full-length feature film, which I heard Felipe saying we'll be ready next year. I thought it was going to be this year, Felipe. But anyway, <laughs> thanks very much uh, for coming here tonight and enjoying the film. Thanks. Good evening. Just in case you're wondering what I'm doing here, I was Bob, the old guy with the bonnet. I was his right-hand man. I shot short along with Bob. And I can clearly remember him turning up that day and saying, we've got Chilean engines in here. I, and I'll be honest, I went, oh, so? And he said, our union has taken a decision that they're condemning that government. Now, the AEU, the Engineer and Union at that time, let me assure you, it was as right wing in stature. <laughs> but they had taken this decision because it was an easy decision to take. But having taken it, it became a tool for us. <laughs> so Bob says, we'll black it. So we started walking around the section and we, we actually stopped men working and we wrote black, which means we've taken a decision, you can't work in that. And the guys, they, they, they are delighted because they get sitting in their ass for a wee while. <laughs> and normally that type of thing gets resolved within an hour to three or four hours. And, you know, we weren't sure what would happen because we didn't really have the authority to do what we were doing. But we had pushed the boat out and it was for somebody else to sink it. And our, in, our, in our factory, nearly well, the whole trade union movement was to the left, very much so. Uh, it was in the ascendancy. Uh, so uh, this was a, it was a natural decision for us to take. It was, we were involved in all sorts of things. So this is what we'd done. It, was not, it really was initially a big deal. This is what we'd done. So we blacked everything. And then we had the Watch Committee, John and Company, coming over asking for an explanation. And as Bob said, they actually contacted London and we started moving very quickly. And... Uh, it was just, we just kept throwing spanners into the works uh, and, it, and it went for there and then MPs got involved and it just, it was like shoving over a domino and it's, it, you know, it was shoving two dominoes after that, then four, it was quite amazing to watch uh, and it was a great thing to be involved in. Thanks. I'd just like to make one final point. Uh, that film, the short film, leaves an impression, and obviously the full length uh, documentary that Philippe made will tell the whole story. But the engines were slapped together, put in the crates. Before an engine leaved, uh, left the factory at that time, it had to be tested and then dispatched. Those engines were never tested and they were never dispatched, so there was two other steps in the procedure before they could tell when an engine could fly or not fly. And those two key events because if you test an engine and some wrong, it can't fly. And that, was, that never happened to those four engines. So I think it's important maybe at this stage to say that and hopefully we'll find out a lot more information from the full-length documentary. There's a roving microphone. Um, if anybody has it, we can, I think we'll get time for a couple of questions. Uh, 
uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the film's obviously an inspiration uh, to all of us. How much pressure was put on the workforce by the management of Rolls Royce to, you know, to deal with this issue? Well, obviously, the Rolls Royce at that time was a nationalised company. In other words, the government was in charge. Uh, and in February '73, the first Labour government came in with a minority Labour government. In '74, '74 that was rather. And then there was another election in October that year, and Harold Dalton managed to get a slim majority. So that changed, obviously, the politi political context, and they were more or less in charge. And then I think there was uh, Ted Heath challenged Wilson. Uh, and Parliament, it's in the records in Hansard. But why didn't he tell the workers to get on and build these engines? And Harold Wilson told them, he says, how can I make them build these engines? If they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. So that probably had a major influence because technically the government were in charge of the Rolls Royce at that time. But obviously the management wanted the work done, but because it was nationalised, they felt it was political and they didn't really want uh, much to do with it. They tried, obviously, whenever they could, to ask us to get the engines built. To start. And right towards the end, again, uh, they asked us if we would help to move the engines. And after a factory meeting, the factory unanimously endorsed the fact that we would no way help the engines to be moved from the East Kilbride factory. So there was pressure, yeah, it came from time to time. But the factory was united with a well-organised shop shares committee and that was probably the key to the whole event. We had well-organised uh, through our union organisations and there was nine trade unions at that time who were members of the joint shop shares committee. But we spoke as one voice and again, because of that strength, then the management were very careful what they did because they didn't want the rest of the engines. I mean, we were on strike that year as well for four weeks for a wage increase. I think we get five pounds across the board which was a big increase in those days. So not only were we work, not working in Chilean engines, we weren't working in any engines that year. So uh, yes, the traffic put pressure, but we managed to keep uh, the work together and it was to the workers' credit at the end of the day. Thanks. Hi, Felipe. Uh, hey, I wanted to, hi. Uh, I, I know that the, the short film has been shown in Chile. Could you talk a little bit about the reaction over there? Of course, yes. The, um, it, it's, um, it was eventually selected. It is quite a nice story. You know, like, as I said, um, when I started, the, that, that iconic shot of the plane uh, flying over Santiago, that grainy black and white footage is from a, a documentary called The Battle of Chile by a, a Chilean filmmaker called Patricia Guzman. Uh, who was himself an exile? He was he was in the stadium, uh, managed to manage to escape, and has become one of the the best and more uh, powerful filmmakers for the cause at the time. He's still making films, and his new film is coming out at the Glasgow Film Festival uh, this month. Um, and he has he has a he has a, a documentary film festival in Chile, and. You know, early on, almost like a mentor, I, I sent him a rough cut of the film and I said, you know, what do you think? And he absolutely loved it. And he, um, he premiered the film at his, fe at a, at his festival. And it, it, it seemed to have a really, there was this kind of slow motion impact of people kind of watching this for the first time. They heard the story in, in, as the film was programmed and, and a lot of people showed up, you know, sort of, uh, expecting to be deflated at the bubble to burst and we were there with the film crew we had this idea for to document the impact at the time and we said um, um, you know anybody wants to see the anybody wants to the, unfortunately the, the guys can't travel to Chile so but if anyone wants to leave a message you know we'll be out there with a camera and a sound and, and a microphone and, and you can mainly leave a message and for about an hour people queued up to leave a message of gratitude and explain why this meant so much to them. And many people were um, former exiles would return to Chile after the democracy. And, and they said how important it was. A lot of people said, you know, I'd heard of, of you, meaning the guys, I've heard, I'd heard of what you might have done. They always thought it was a joke, I thought it was a rumor. And to be able to see your faces and to be able to hear your voice explaining your story and articulate the power you had at the time, it actually, um, 
gave roots to their own history. And you know, one, one woman in particular said that she actually could tell her history of the exile and the solidarity that they were, the, the solidarity campaign in the UK to her kids, not as just a myth or a legend, but something that actually happened. And she thought, you know, after, after time, after years, you think that you're not even sure what you, what you did and what you went through because nobody, nobody acknowledges it. And um, so seeing, seeing the story told this way, I think uh, had a great impact. And it's, it's really what has carried us so far. And I mean, it's been, it's been the last three years have been absolutely amazing. It's it, obviously we've been um, face to face with some horrific things. There's a part of the history, obviously we can't, that can never be changed, and that's all the, the death and the torture, which is absolutely horrendous. I grew up in Belgium, and where you were taught about um, the Holocaust and World War II, and to think that 30 years later this would still happen again in, in a country which I felt so close by and knew nothing about was, was really hard to believe. And for, for the last three years, we've been collecting interviews with... Um, not only the guys in Scotland, but many people were involved in the solidarity campaigns here. Many of the political prisoners who sort of, as you'll see, benefited from this story. And it's in a kind of weird twist of fate. Um, I was in Chile uh, um, two months ago, and finally the Air Force agreed, you know, somewhat reluctantly, but to, uh, to contribute to the film. And it's the first time that in a, in a documentary about this part of Chilean history, both sides will represent it. And um, I think it, it's quite interesting to sit in front of these people and tell their story. One of them even with, you know, shook my hand at the end. And, I, and as I thank him for his memories, and I said, well, you know, it's important for memory needs to be preserved. And there was absolutely no irony in the way he said that. The, uh, it's, it's a baffling thing to see in front of people who you know have committed horrible things and they'll tell you that the only thing, they, it was a thing that felt right to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's quite hard to, do, to go over the, uh, the reactions from the film. We're still processing it in many ways and um, I still haven't told John how it ended, which I'm doing tomorrow. Um, so, um, so yeah, so give us, give us a few months, but we'll come back, we'll come back with, with quite a thing. Thank you. One last thing, Stuart is a wonderful poet. It used to, poetry used to be his, his little uh, act of rebellion within the factory and used to put a load of anonymous notes in the, in the Rosor factory when he thought something was wrong. Um, and if you go on YouTube and look for the Glasgow poet, you'll find many of, of Stuart's um, poetry. And it's, uh, I absolutely recommend it. Thank you.